Welcome to MMA Heat, the show that is all about heart, endurance, aggression, and technique in MMA and in entertainment. I'm Karen Bryant. We are here at the Fortune Gym in Los Angeles, California, and this is what's going on today. We're going to introduce you to Phil Mr. Wonderful Davis. He is a rising star in the UFC. You're going to get to know what makes him tick. We're also going to hang out with Mark Munoz, Uriah Faber, Fabricio Verdum, Jake Ellenberger, and Joseph Benavides at the one-year anniversary party at Rain Training Center. And we're also going to see what artist and MMA fan Michael Kalish put together to celebrate the one and only boxing legend Muhammad Ali. But first, we're going to get things started with Vladimir Matyshenko and his gun collection. Now, Vlad is in the UFC light heavyweight division as well, and uh, he's originally from Belarus, also known as the janitor. Now, he's got his own gym called VMAT down in El Segundo, California, if you ever want to go down there and train with him and Jared Hammond and Tony Hardonk. Well, anyway, the janitor is a big time gun collector. We went over to his house and he showed us some of his favorite pieces. Take a look. So Vlad, when did you first start collecting guns? Well, uh, my first gun was, uh, you know, as soon as I got my citizenship, I used my right to bear arms. <laughs> <laughs> and from there you went crazy. <laughs> Alright, well let's get started. I want to see what you have here. Well, you know. What was the first one you got? Well, first one I got is a piece of history. Here's a, a Russian Mosin. It's a 1942. World War II gun, but it still shoots pretty far. With this one, you can shoot somebody a mile away. But it's pretty simple. It's uh, you know uh, very reliable. Like I said, it's, it still shoots, and I go hunt with it. And really? Well, fun. that's impressive. And this thing is fun. You can. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. You can put this thing on. Right. And then you actually can, when you run out of ammo, yeah. you can. <laughs> really? More modern version is yeah. like a SKS. It's an automatic, semi-automatic weapon. You can just shoot bomb, bomb, bomb. It's, but also have. A little thing right here. <laughs> That's hardcore. Yeah. This one you can get somebody pretty far too. Oh well, there you got your scope on there. Right? Yeah. Well, this one uses with the scope. This uh, uses it mostly for the hunting, like deer hunting uh -huh. rifle. This is a little bit more bigger uh, cartilage than uh, most in a gun, but. Uh, Barrel shorter, but still goes pretty far. This one you can shoot mile away somebody too. You really like the distance. I'm <laughs> finding that's your thing. You're just sneaky about it. But do you actually you? So do you hunt often? Not as often again as I want to. Yeah. I miss my hunting uh, this uh, season because again my fight was you know during that time. So. Damn career. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You have to work. You have to money for pay for ammunition. You know. Yeah. <laughs> this one is a good one too, but uh, this particular one is. Uh, Lever action, okay. so you can uh, reload faster. But also, I like this one because you can look in the scope and underneath the iron side. Oh, okay. So if it's too close, you can just look up there and right look here. So it's it's a pretty good one. There's a few shotguns. Okay. There's a, a little one, a little bit you know old historical one. Oh, okay, nice. Made yeah. in Spain. Yeah. This is a one shot. Right. To a 20 gauge, small, but still it's good hunting. This one, I need to clean up this one now. <laughs> I can take it apart because I went shooting and then clean. Oh. This is a, you know, most reason that you go hunting with it for the birds or we use for clay shooting okay. and stuff like that. Actually. And what kind is it? <clears throat> this is a Winchester. Winchester, that's what I was going to Yeah, guess. but it's a semi mic You can hit the three shots in one, like boom, 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 uh -huh. without reloading it. This one oh, it looks cool. intimidating, but yeah, no, that, that's like but it's Terminator a, action right yeah, there. Yeah, but it's a self-defense kind of type of thing. If you sit on the couch, somebody walk in the front door, then you can hit him. For <laughs> hunting, it's too short of a barrel. Okay. So, but it, it, it gets like six shots here, and you can put five here, so you have a lot of ammo too. Okay. You, know, you can take a lot of guys with a short, <laughs> I guess in so. short time. I guess so. And then this folds out. Yeah, or? this folds out. So if you want to be. <laughs> I feel like that. That's pretty bad. <laughs> that's a police uh, type of gun. That's uh, right. almost like cops using it. It's a 45 Glock. Right, uh, right, right. Glock 21, whatever right. it's called. Nice. It's a big, I mean, you can stuff somebody, but again, it's not very accurate because it's short barrel. And that's my favorite. <laughs> Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> Dirty Harry. Oh, man. <laughs> Magnum 44. Actually, you can use this one for hunting. And, uh, we actually, <laughs> for for the boar, wild sucks. boars. No, for wild boars, you can actually go and then people go and hunt, uh, really? hunt with, the, uh, with the handgun. Yes, yeah, it's, it's legal too, yeah. That just seems a little bit wrong. I don't know. What do you mean? I don't know. I feel like if you're hunting, I feel like I, I would prefer a rifle. I don't know. This just seems a little more, I don't well, know. Well, it's, it's more excitement into it because if you shoot from far, there's no danger into That's it. That's true. But if you hunt with the boars, they actually can attack you. Yeah. So if you miss and you screw, <laughs> so it's kind of like more like 
fighting game instead of okay, just, you're right. so it's more fair to the animal. <laughs> You're not supposed to have AKs okay. legally. Okay. But just for you guys, I can show one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's oh, exactly yeah. the same replica. That's right, baby. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty crazy. So, about that contract, <laughs> right? <laughs> Oops, actually. <laughs> Shot your ceiling. <laughs> well, thanks for showing them to us well, and remind me to never come over here. <laughs> sneak up on you. <laughs> <laughs> sneak up on me. <laughs> Don't make that mistake. <laughs> Well, that is a pretty serious arsenal that Vlad has, but in truth, that man has a really great sense of humor. You want to check out Janitor Tips on MMAHeat.com if you want some MMA comedy. Stay with us. When we return, we'll go down to Orange County and hang with some MMA superstars at Ray Training Center. I'm Karen Bryan. I want to welcome you back to MMA Heat. Still to come, you will find out how Phil Davis became Mr. Wonderful. But right now, we're going to go down to the one-year anniversary party at Rain Training Center. This place is owned by Mark Munoz, a man who's really making a name for himself in the UFC middleweight division. He's got wins over Kendall Grove, Aaron Simpson, and C.B. Dalloway. So most days, you can find him at Rain training with or teaching some of the biggest names in MMA. We caught up with Mark and his friends Uriah Faber, Fabrizio Verdum, Jake Ellenberger, and Joseph Benavides to get the secret behind Rain's success. Mark, how good does it feel to know that your gym is successful, not only with pros, but, but with regular folks as well? Uh, it feels awesome. I mean, just, just the amount of work we put into the gym. I mean, we put our heart and soul into this gym. And, and um, you know, the, basically the premise behind the gym is, you know, it's called Rain, Rain Training Center. I'm a man of faith, and I know who reigns over my life. And um, I want him to reign over the gym. At the same time, I want to reign over my competition. Why is it that you come from Nebraska all the way down to Rain to, to train when you're when you're getting ready for a fight? Um, for, I, I like the the training partners out here. Um, you know, Mark's been a really good friend of mine for a while, and uh, he's helped me out. You know, as a coach and, and a training partner. But uh, there's just a, for me, um, there's a lot more higher level guys out here to train with. So uh, you know, Nebraska's always home for me. But uh, I spend a lot of my time out here training. You know, I'm out here training right now, and I don't even have a fight coming up. But I split my time. You know, probably back and forth but um yeah i just say the, the the coaching and the training partners you know um we, we train at kings too with master rafael cordero you know that guy's an amazing coach I, I love working with him so uh it's yeah it's great so many of you guys professionals come here to train why do you like to train here it's very good training i mean training monday wednesday friday in kings mma with uh, rafael he tuesday he, uh tuesday thursday here it's very good training. I have just professional fighter in the morning. Everybody got the rest and training, just the technical training. And after two o'clock, the conditional training with Christoph. Christoph, what? The Christoph? Uh, yeah, Suzinski. Suzinski, yeah. He's a very good guy. He's very good condition. He's good. Yeah, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Have maybe 20, 25, 30 people. It's just professional. It's very good sparring. Very good technique. It's Marco Munoz is my good friend. It's, I like that. I like uh, Mark. So you come down here to rain sometimes to hang out, to train a little bit. What is it about Mark in this gym that's uh, so inviting? Uh, there's just a lot of love in here. As you guys can see um, to the side of us, there's just children playing everywhere. So there's a lot of love in the gym, you know, and you feel it, I think, right when you come in. You know, just it, I mean, it all starts with Mark Munoz. You know, he's a natural-born leader, you know, and just, just a great guy as a, as a person, you know, family member, teammate, friend, everything. You know, it all starts with him. So it's just a great inviting gym. And, you know, on top of that, the gym is, is to work out with tough fighters. And, you know, Mark's, Mark's the, the best of the best, and he has the best of the best training here. So just all around a uh, great environment. What's so special about Mark? Mark and his gym and his vibe. I've been lucky enough to coach alongside of him at UC Davis. That's how we met. And while I was there, I just learned so much about about wrestling and about uh, you know learning and, and being being a good coach and things like that. And I I think it's it's one of those things that he has a real knack for. He's a he's a real leader and he's the type of guy that rises to the top of everything he does. And and you can see that in his gym and his family and and his fighting and his wrestling. So. Um, yeah, he's just a good dude.
I want to talk a little bit about the workout that you went through over there in Sparks. Can you talk about that workout and how often you do that? I had a 16 and a half pound vest, but he strapped it so tight that it that it limited my breathing, constricted my breathing. So, so I so I was going through like oxygen depri deprivation and I I couldn't breathe. So what it does it it increases your red blood cell count and be able to be able to for your body to run more efficient but in the process it's so hard I do uh, three three rounds um, three rounds for five minutes um, from 12 weeks until six weeks I go four rounds you know um, six to four weeks I do five rounds three to two weeks and then I take off you know I bring it back down after two weeks so so yeah it's pretty tough Man, Mark's workout is intense. Now, he also does Christoph Szczynski's conditioning system. You can as well if you just want to go down and sign up at Rain. Just don't forget your puke bucket. Stay with us right here on MMA Heat. Next up, you'll find out why Phil Davis rocks pink shorts in the octagon. You're watching MMA Heat. I'm Karen Bryant. Still to come on the program, artist and fight fan Michael Kalish gives us a story behind his amazing Muhammad Ali monument. But right now, it's time to get to know Phil Davis. He's known as Mr. Wonderful in the UFC's light heavyweight division, and he is definitely a rising star there. At the time of the conversation you're about to see, he was 9-0 and had just beaten Little Nog. We caught up with him at Brandon Vera's Alliance MMA down in Chula Vista, California. We got the story on the Mr. Wonderful nickname, the Little pink shorts he likes to wear, and a whole lot more. So Phil, I am curious about your background as a wrestler. Mm -hmm. I, I, you seem relatively modest, even though you, you know, your nickname is just wonderful. Mm -hmm. but, but brag a little bit about your career as a wrestler, because this is really quite good, wasn't it? Uh, it was all right. I, um, I, I went to Penn State, and uh, I was a four-time All-American, uh, two-time Big Ten champion, and 2008 national champion. And you could tell that you're a pretty good wrestler because your ears are normal. Yeah, well, that's number one. <laughs> yeah, because that's, that, that, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Nobody would probably peg you as a wrestler because they don't, they, I mean, they're, they don't look. Yeah, someone told me that once. I was like, yeah, I used to wrestle. <laughs> you weren't any good. <laughs> Got me there. You were either flawless or, yeah, or you totally sucked, right? Got me there. <laughs> nice, nice. That's great. So I do want to talk about the Mr. Wonderful mm -hmm. name. Who gave it to you? Is it something you came up with yourself? How did that even come about? Because it's, it's, it's. It's one of those nicknames that everybody right. likes, and it's just, it's fun to say, it's just a good nickname. Well, it started out, um, I had a cat in college, and um, his name was Mr. Wonderful, and I was away traveling with my wrestling team, and I came home, and I just, I just suffered a loss, it's a rough weekend, I get home, my cat's gone, oh, no. I don't know. I was looking around the neighborhood for hours with a runny nose in the snow. <laughs> Couldn't find him. It was just, it was just a, I'm sorry I'm laughing. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's okay. Let it out. Right. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm cool. I'm nah. cool, yeah. And so, you know, whenever I started fighting, um, uh, my friends just decided that I should uh, carry on the wonderful name. Okay, right. You also are known for the pink shorts, the mm -hmm, little shorts. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan. Ladies yeah. love the little shorts. It's risky though. Not everybody can pull it off. <laughs> Not everybody can pull it off. But you're pulling it off. What, honestly, is there a um, comfort level? Is there a why? Why do you choose those shorts? Why do you choose them in pink? Um. Well, pink. I mean, well, the American Cancer Society is definitely uh, something that I, I support, and uh, I have uh, friends and family that are. Um, recovering from yeah. cancer, so it's just always something that's close to me. Yeah. Um, why? I, my first fight, I had like a, a pink ribbon. Okay. And uh, they're always on the the banner and on my shorts. Yeah. Um, I decided to go with the pink shorts. Now that part was closer to a dare because they were like, ah! why why go with the ribbon? Why not just wear pink shorts? I will do it. Right. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things. You should never dare me anymore. Oh no? Really? Yeah, I'll do it. Oh, good to know. I'm uh -huh. gonna file that away. Yeah, but now I like the pink shorts, so it's it just stuck. Are there fighters that you see now that you look up to, or fighters that you know you see their career and you'd like to have yours in that same kind of trajectory? Oh, definitely. I'm a, a big, you know, Anderson fan, yeah. GSP fan, Cain um, Velasquez fan. Um, 
Chuck Liddell is probably my favorite fighter really? ever. Yeah. I come just, just cause he's just you know besides the fact that he's he was a champ and you know had so many title defenses he's just the man. You know you, you can't really like put it into words exactly. Can anyone else ever chuck someone? I don't know. That is, that's that's really what it is. It's a verb. You, he chucked it. Well, you know, when he was out there, he was chucking it. That's right. That's great. That's great. Well, it's true because he's got one of those those faces and that vibe of like, yeah, bring it, whatever. Like, you yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. Like, just, just bring it. I'll do it, whatever. Like, he doesn't even. You want me to fight that guy? Cool. I'll fight whatever. that guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, that's great. I love it. But at this point, you're fighting guys you know sometimes. And right. Fight guys, that you, it's probably easier to fight someone you don't like, and maybe it doesn't happen that often, though. So how do you get that aggression to the right place to... Well, not for me. I, I, I would hate to fight a guy who I actually didn't like. Just yeah. because I feel like the, the act of hitting someone because I don't like them would cloud my, my vision. I, would, I like to just be completely analytical and be black and white about this is what I need to do, this is my game plan, not I don't like this guy, I'm gonna embarrass this guy. I wanna I wanna elbow this guy in his shin just because I don't like him. You know that's yeah, you yeah, don't yeah, need yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You don't need spiteful Phil out there. You want you want someone who's just gonna go out there and do what they're paid to do. That's it. Uh, yeah, not Phil Mr. Spiteful, right? No, Phil Mr. Spiteful. <laughs> He comes out from time to time. Really? Yes, he does. You don't want that. I had a really good time with Phil. He's a very cool guy. If you'd like to find out how he spends his paychecks and what he thinks of haters, we've got a lot more of that interview on MMAHeat.com. But don't go away. When we return, you'll see how 1,300 speed bags can turn into a portrait of one of the greatest fighters of all time. I'm Karen Bryant, you are watching MMA Heat, and we want to take you now to the Realized Project. This is a movable monument to the greatest boxer of all time, Muhammad Ali. Fight fan and artist Michael Kalish put this together to honor the man and to continue his legacy. Take a look at this and you will see how 1,300 speed bags and over five miles of cable came together to create just an incredible, amazing portrait of the greatest. Can you please explain what's going on here and sort of how you came up with this idea? Yeah, so three years ago I reached out to the Ali's, they're collectors of mine, mm -hmm. friends, and I had an honest conversation with her that there needed to be a monument to Muhammad Ali yeah. um, for what he meant to sport and what he means to politics and religion, he's mm -hmm. in so many worlds, but something engaging, something really, really unique and something using a real speed bag. I love mixed media and taking something out of context, mm -hmm. putting it in the form of art. Obviously nothing this <laughs> monumental, there's three years ago and here we are right now right. unveiling it. But I asked her, I was like, what do you think about something that engages a new generation of, of Ali fans? And the idea of having thousands of boxing bags somehow suspended in air and then when you walk around it's really abstract but you get to a certain place and they all line up to form a photorealistic face of Muhammad Ali. And she was like, oh, it's beautiful. How are you going to do it? And I was like, I have no clue, but it's really cool. And then, you know, so started this relationship and we brought a an amazing architectural firm by the name of Euler Wood Collaborative and um, started modeling it and spent months and months working on the design. It's very mathematical and very academic and then started uh, fabricating and working with the bags and here we are getting ready to unveil it. Well it's really spectacular and exactly yeah how many bags are there how much cable? There's a lot of stats so there's 1300 bags three different sizes two different colors to create that contrast uh, like five miles of stainless steel cable they're all suspended from the top and the bottom, so there's very little movement in it, okay. and so it always, you know, maintains that photorealistic element. Um, there's miles of aluminum tubing, and, I mean, and, and grates. I mean, thousands and thousands of screws, and it's just—it's by far the biggest piece monument that I've ever embarked on. And, and this kind of gets me in this direction of building these large-scale pieces. It's going to travel, so it's all modular. Comes together for about a week and a half, comes apart, and then goes to another city, probably twice a year. Nice, and we're. Are you always a Muhammad Ali fan? What was the impetus behind putting this together? I'm a huge sports fan. I'm a big boxing fan. Okay. Of course, like growing up, like in the Tyson era, and you know, on the heels of Ali, but you know, father who was big Ali fan yeah. went to fights, and now I'm like, you know, less boxing and more current form of MMA, everything. Um, although I'm a big Pacquiao fan, yeah. but I'm a huge fan of Ali and the person he was, and the fact that 
he's a legend and there never will ever be another icon, especially in sport, at that level. I think they still say he's one of the most recognizable athletes of all time. He is the, it was just, it came out like a few months ago that he's the most recognizable athlete in the world. And that's the thing I like the parallel between this piece and who Ali is. He's, he's so multidimensional and even abstract from all these different angles, but when you get right in front of him, he's truly the greatest. Like this piece, which is, you know, which is a really unique piece that is very abstract, but only makes sense when you get right in front of it. So it's a really nice parallel of how dimensional he is and um, with the bags and then, you know, you position him. So, I mean, there's only one, in my mind, there's only one person you could drop into something that would take me two and a half years to, to, to do, and that's something at this scale, and it's someone like an Ali, someone with a presence like that. So prior to this, what medium were you working in, and, and how did you even come to know that you could pull this off? I just came to know I could pull this off about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> I kind of got known from taking license plates and taking them out of context and assembling these really large contemporary collectible pieces of Americana and then I moved up the car and started repurposing old vintage tailgates and making roses and sculptures. I love that play of taking something completely out of context, putting it in a different form of contemporary art and then just wanted to do it on a whole other level. Um, and how do we capture Ali? What, when I spoke to them about, about making something monumental, it was because he's a monument. Sure. So it's like, he is Mount Rushmore. He is the Statue of Liberty. He is, he is those things. So short of climbing up on, 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 on top of a mountain and carving his face in there, which is what he's deserved, you know, he deserves something at this scale, but something engaging to a new generation. Realize Monument really is spectacular in person. If you want to see if it's coming anywhere near you, check out realizeali.com. Well, that does it for us here at MMA Heat. I want to thank everybody at Fortune Gym for their hospitality. I want to remind you that you can join our Facebook fan page and you can always see more interviews on MMAheat.com. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm Karen Bryant. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.